Brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. Another day, another strange and potentially heretical uttering from Paca Papa Francis. It was time to dust off that old nickname for him, given the news that I have for you today. And this video is going to be longer than usual because I'm going to give you some evidence directly from the source of his utterance. In the years since the Second Vatican Council, there's been an attempt to rehabilitate the most notorious and perhaps most theologically evil priest in the 20th century church, Teilhard de Chardin, a man celebrated by secular powers, including archaeologists and geologists, a priest of the Jesuit order known for having fraudulently fabricated the skeleton of a creature to try to sell the theory of evolution, a man known to have rejected the theology of the church for something more materialistic and cosmological. Chardin's influence was widespread in the church after the council, with Ratzinger and a few others considered by today's standards to be orthodox and conservative, saying that Chardin was misunderstood and misrepresented, though later as Benedict XVI, Ratzinger would definitely backtrack on that and would say that Chardin's writings should be read in light of the church's traditions, which is basically saying that Chardin can only be read in light of the hermeneutic of continuity. It would have been better to just say no to Chardin's writings, but that was an extremely unpopular position to take, even when Benedict was Pope. In the years before the Council, Chardin's writings were declared dangerous by the Holy Office, and Catholics were generally forbidden from them. We were warned to steer clear of the writings of Teilhard de Chardin. So this week started off with a bang, with Francis now declaring his writings misunderstood and misrepresented. Let's check the story out here. Francis cited Chardin's Mass on the World, which was a poem of Chardin's celebrating what he considered to be the cosmological nature of Christ. Francis did this during his trip to Mongolia. And prior to all of this, Francis quoted Chardin in Laudato Si, Francis's encyclical letter published in 2015 that basically told Catholics that we had to care about the secular world's green program, or we weren't good Catholics, a point that is constantly reiterated by the Francis wing of the church today. And it's certainly odd that Francis cited Chardin and positively quoted him, since Chardin was a favorite of a certain German political party in the 1930s. He adopted their science of the flesh, including their attempts to purposely create better and perfect human beings through bizarre and demonic human husbandry theories, we'll say. So let's actually talk about Chardin for a moment here. A few years ago, I presented the key writing of his that many observers believe is his admission to having been demonically possessed and that he voluntarily became possessed in what some exorcists call perfect possession, which Malachi Martin described as being when someone knows they're possessed and is perfectly fine with it. They love the situation and wouldn't give up the situation at all. Whether that is the case for Teilhard de Chardin, I'll let you decide, and I'll do so by giving you the full text of his encounter of the thing. But before we get to that, I want to let you know what a more mainstream, traditional-leaning Catholic voice said of him. The following is an account of Dietrich von Hildebrand of his brief meeting with Chardin, where Hildebrand tried to challenge Chardin using St. Augustine. The venom Chardin spits at St. Augustine is quite revealing here. So here is Dietrich von Hildebrand's account of that exchange with Teilhard de Chardin. This is the account of Dietrich von Hildebrand and his encounter with Teilhard de Chardin, as recorded in his book, A Trojan Horse in the City of God. I met Teilhard de Chardin in 1951 at a dinner arranged by Father Robert Gannon, S.J., then president of Fordham University. Previously, the noted scholars Father Henry de Lubac and Monsignor Bruno de Solages had highly recommended him to me. I was therefore full of expectations. After the meal, Father Teilhard delivered a long exposition of his views. Teilhard's lecture was a great disappointment, for it manifested utter philosophical confusion, especially in his conception of the human person. I was even more upset by his theological primitiveness. He ignored completely the decisive difference between nature and supernature. After a lively discussion in which I ventured a criticism of his ideas, I had an opportunity to speak to Teilhard privately. When our talk touched on St. Augustine, he exclaimed violently, Don't mention that unfortunate man. He spoiled everything by introducing the supernatural. This remark confirmed the impression I had gained of the crass naturalism of his views. 
But it also struck me in another way. The criticism of St. Augustine, the greatest of the fathers of the church, betrayed Teilhard's lack of genuine sense of the supernatural. Note that Chardin hated St. Augustine and how he introduced a supernatural aspect to the faith. But of course, that's nonsense in and of itself. The faith, is, the faith has always acknowledged the preternatural and the supernatural. Those were not fabrications of St. Augustine. He didn't introduce that to the faith. The doctor of the church focused on them, and his theology was essential in the development of Catholic theology. But to say he introduced the supernatural, as Chardin says, is beyond nonsensical. But that is what we expect from the man whose theology is now synonymous with natural materialism. He had been credibly accused of denying original sin due to his love of evolution, and having been a pantheist due to his anthropological work in Southeast Asia and other places. Now, it's worth noting that few are willing to touch the strangest thing Chardin ever encountered, what he called the thing, which is his encounter with likely a preternatural intelligence, his dialogue with it, and what looks like his submission to the preternatural intelligence. His account of this is long, it's written from the third person, and it almost reads like fiction, but it's not. The preternatural, by the way, is simply another word for the demonic, just to make sure you understand that. So here is his own account of the thing. And the following is the writings of, the, of Teilhard de Chardin himself. This comes from his work, The Hymn of the Universe. And while this is written in the third person, this is widely believed to have been a confessional. The man was walking in the desert, followed by his companion, when the thing swooped down on him. From afar a head appeared to him, quite small, gliding over the sand, no bigger than the palm of a child's hand, as a pale, fleeting shadow, like a wavering flight of quail over the blue sea before the sunrise or a cloud of gnats dancing in the sun at evening or a whirlwind of dust at midday sweeping over the plain. The thing seemed to take no heed of the two travelers, and was roaming capriciously through the wilderness. Then suddenly it assumed a set course, and with the speed of an arrow came straight at them. And then the man perceived that the little pale cloud of vapor was but the center of an infinitely greater reality, moving towards them without restriction, formless, boundless. The thing as it approached them spread outwards with prodigious rapidity, as far as his eye could reach filling the whole of space, while its feet brushed lightly over the thorny vegetation beside the torrent. Its brow rose in the sky like a golden mist with the reddening sun behind it. And all about it the ether had become alive, vibrating palpably beneath the crude substance of rock and plants, as in summer the landscape quivers behind the overheated soil and the ground. What was advancing towards them was the moving heart of an immeasurable, pervasive subtlety. The man pro fell prostrate to the ground, and hiding his face in his hands, he waited. A great silence fell around him. Then suddenly a breath of scorching air passed across his forehead, broke through the barrier of his closed eyelids, and penetrated his soul. The man felt that he was ceasing to be merely himself. An irresistible rapture took possession of him, as though all the sap of all living things, flowing at one and the same moment into the two narrow confines of his heart, was mightily refashioning the enfeebled fibers of his being. And at the same time the anguish of some superhuman peril oppressed him, a confused feeling that the force which had swept down upon him was equivocal, turbid, the combined essence of all evil and all goodness. The hurricane was within himself. And now in the very depths of the being it had invaded, the tempest of life, infinitely gentle, infinitely brutal, was murmuring to the one secret point in the soul which it had not altogether demolished. You called me here. Here I am, driven by the spirit far from humanity's caravan routes. You dared to venture into the untouched wilderness, grown weary of abstractions, of attenuations, of the wordiness of social life. You wanted to pit yourself against reality, entire and untamed. You had need of me in order to grow, and I was waiting for you in order to be made holy. Always you have, without knowing it, desired me, and always I have been drawing you to me. And now I am established on you for life, or for death. You can never go back, never return to commonplace gratifications or untroubled worship. He who has once seen me can never forget me. He must either condemn himself with me or save me with himself. Are you coming? O oh, you who are divine and mighty, what is your name? Speak, replied the man. I am the fire that consumes and the water that overthrows. I am the love that initiates and the truth that passes away. 
all that compels acceptance and all that brings renewal, all that breaks apart and all that binds together, power, experiment, progress, matter, all this am I. Because in my violence I sometimes slay my lovers, because he who touches me never knows what power he is unleashing. Wise men fear me and curse me. They speak of me with scorn, calling me beggar woman or witch or harlot, but their words are at variance with life. And the Pharisees who condemn me waste away in the outlook to which they confine themselves. They die of inanition, and their disciples desert them, because I am the essence of all that is tangible, and men cannot do without me. You who have grasped that the world, the world beloved of God, has even more than individuals, a soul to be redeemed, lay your whole being wide open to my inspiration, and receive the spirit of the earth which is to be saved. The supreme key to the enigma, the dazzling utterance which is inscribed on my brow and which henceforth will burn into your eyes, even though you close them, is this. Nothing is precious save what is yourself in others and others in yourself. In heaven all things are but one. In heaven all is one. Come, do you not feel my breath uprooting you and carrying you away? Up, man of God, and make haste. For according to the way a man surrenders himself to it, the whirlwind will either drag him down into the darkness of its depths, or lift him up into blue skies. Your salvation and mine hang on this first moment. O you who are matter, my heart as you see is trembling. Since it is you, tell me, what would you have me do? Said the man. Take up your arms, O Israel, and do battle boldly against me. The wind, having at first penetrated and pervaded him stealthily, like a filter, had now become aggressive, hostile. From within its coils it exhaled now the acrid stench of battle. The musky smell of forests, the feverish atmosphere of cities, the sinister, heady scent that rises up from nations locked in battle. All this writhed within its folds, a vapor gathered from the four corners of the earth. The man, still prostrate, suddenly started, as though his flesh had felt the spur. He leapt to his feet and stood, facing the storm. It was the storm of his entire race that had shuddered with him, an obscure memory of a first sudden awakening in the midst of beasts stronger, better armed than he, a sad echo of the long struggle to tame the corn and to master the fire, a rancorous dread of the maleficent forces of nature, a lust for knowledge and possession. A moment ago, in the sweetness of the first contact, he had instinctively longed to lose himself in the wind, warm wind which enfolded him. Now this wave of bliss in which he had all but melted away was changed into a ruthless determination towards increased being. The man had scented the enemy, his hereditary quarry. He dug his feet into the ground and began his battle. He fought first of all in order to not be swept away, but then he began to fight for the joy of fighting, the joy of feeling his own strength. The longer he fought, the more he felt an increase of strength going out from him to balance the strength of his tempest. And from the tempest there came forth in return a new exhalation, which flowed like fire into his veins. As on certain nights the sea around a swimmer will grow luminous, and its eddies will glisten the more brightly. Under the sturdy threshing of his limbs, so the dark power wrestling with the man was lit up with a thousand sparkling lights under the impact of his onslaught. In a reciprocal awakening of the opposed powers, he stirred up his utmost strength to achieve the mastery over it, while it revealed all its treasures in order to surrender them to him. Son of Earth, steep yourself in the sea of matter. Bathe in its fiery waters, for it is the source of your life and your youthfulness. You thought you could do without it because the power of thought has been kindled in you. You hoped that the more thoroughly you rejected the tangible, the closer you would be to spirit, that you would be more divine if you lived in the world of pure thought, or at least more angelic if you fled the corporeal. Well, you were like to have perished of hunger. You must have oil for your limbs, blood for your veins, water for your soul, the wa world of reality for your intellect. Do you not see that the very law of your own nature makes these a necessity for you? Never if you live to gr and grow, never will you be able to say to matter, I have seen enough of you. I have surveyed your mysteries and have taken from them enough food for my thought to last me forever. I tell you, even though like the sage of sages, you carried in your memory the image of all the beings that people the earth or swim in the seas, still all that knowledge would be as nothing for your soul. For all abstract knowledge is only a faded reality. This is because to understand the world no word knowledge is not enough. You must see it, touch it, live in its presence, and drink the vital heat of existence, the very heart of reality. Never say then, as some say, the kingdom of matter is worn out, matter is dead. Till the very end of time, matter will always remain young, exuberant, sparkling, newborn for those who are willing. Never say, matter is accursed, matter is evil, for there has come one who said, you will drink poisonous draughts and they shall not harm you. And again, life shall spring forth out of death. And then finally, the words which spell my definitive liberation, this is my body.
Purity does not lie in separation from, but a deeper penetration into the universe. It is to be found in the love of that unique, boundless essence which penetrates the inmost depths of all things. And there, from within those depths, deeper than the mortal zone where individuals and multitudes struggle, works upon them and molds them. Purity lies in a chaste contact with that which is the same in all. Oh, the beauty of spirit as it rises up adorned with all the riches of the earth. Son of man, bathe yourself in the ocean of matter. Plunge into it where its deepest and most violent struggle in its currents and drink of its water. For it cradled you long ago in your pre-conscious existence, and it is that ocean that will raise you up to God. Standing amidst the tempest, the man turned his head, looking for his companion. In that same moment, he perceived a strange metamorphosis. The earth was simultaneously vanishing away, yet growing in size. It was vanishing away, for here, immediately beneath him, the meaningless variation of the trains were diminishing and dissolving. On the other hand, it was growing ever greater, for there in the distance, the curve of the horizon was climbing ceaselessly higher. The man saw himself standing in the center of an immense cup, the rim of which was closing over him. And then the frenzied battle gave place in his heart to an irresistible longing to submit, and in a flash he had discovered everywhere, present around him, the one thing necessary. Once and for all he understood that, like the atom, man has no value save for that part of himself which passes into the universe. He recognized with absolute certainty the empty fragility of even the noblest theorizings as compared with the definitive plenitude of the smallest fact grasped in its total concrete reality. He saw before his eyes, revealed with pitiless clarity, the ridiculous pretentiousness of human claims to order the life of the world, to pose on the world the dogmas, the standards, the conventions of man. He tasted sickeningly the triteness of men's joys and sorrows, the mean egoism of their pursuits, the insipidity of their passions, the attenuation of their power to feel. He felt pity for those who take fright at the span of a century, or whose love is bounded by the frontiers of a nation. So many things which once had distressed or revolted him, the speeches and pronouncements of the learned, their assertions and their prohibitions, their refusal to allow the universe to move, all seemed to him now merely ridiculous, non-existent compared with the majestic reality the flood of energy which now revealed itself to him, omnipresent, unalterable in its truth, relentless in its development, untouchable in its serenity, maternal and unfailing in its protectiveness. Thus, at long last, he had found a point d'appui. He had found refuge outside the confines of human society. A heavy cloak slipped from his shoulders and fell to the ground behind him, the dead weight of all that is false, narrow, tyrannical, all that is artificially contrived, all that is merely human in humanity. A wave of triumph freed his soul, and he felt that henceforth nothing in the world would ever be able to alienate his heart from the greater reality which was now revealing itself to him, nothing at all. Neither the intrusiveness and the individualistic separatism of human beings, for these qualities in them he despised, nor the heavens and the earth and their height and the breadth of power and depth, for it was precisely to these that he was now dedicating himself forever. A deep process of renewal had taken place within him. Now it would never again be possible for him to be human, save on another plane, were he to descend again now to the everyday life of Earth, even though if he were to rejoin his faithful companion, still prostrate over there on the desert sand, he would henceforth be forever a stranger. Yes, of this he was certain, even for his brothers and God, better men than he, he would inevitably speak henceforth in an incomprehensible tongue. He whom the Lord had drawn to follow the road of fire. Even for those he loved the most, his life would be henceforth a burden, where they would sense his compulsion to be forever seeking something behind themselves. Because matter, throwing off its veil of restless movement and multiplicity, had revealed to him its glorious unity. Chaos now divided him from other men. Because it had ever withdrawn his heart from all that is merely local or individual, all that is fragmentary, Henceforth for him, it alone in its totality would be his father and mother, his family, his race, his unique consuming passion. Not a soul in the world could do anything to change this. Turning his eyes resolutely away from what was receding from him, he surrendered himself in superabounding faith to the wind that was sweeping the universe onwards. And now in the heart of the whirling cloud, a light was growing, a light in which there was the tenderness and mobility of a human glance. And from it there spread a warmth which was not now like the harsh heat radiating from a furnace, but like the opulent warmth, warmth which emanates from a human body. What had been a blind and feral immensity was now becoming expressive and personal, and its hitherto amorphous expanses were being molded into features of an ineffable face. A being was taking form in the totality of space, a being with the attractive power of a soul, palpable like a body, vast as the sky, a being which mingled with things yet remained distinctive from them 
a being of higher order than the substance of things with which it was adorned, yet taking shape with them. The rising sun was being born into the heart of the world. God was shining forth from the summit of that world of matter, whose waves were carrying up to him the world of spirit. The man fell to his knees in the fiery chariot which was bearing him away. That, my friends, is the man Francis says is misunderstood. A man who fabricated a skeleton to promote evolution. A man who is still celebrated by the natural sciences, who is still championed by crystal wavers and others of the pagan movements trying to supplant Christianity more broadly. That man is apparently misunderstood. That man who was once a priest. Chardin is a character that could be expounded upon at great length, and others have done so. But like I said, the Holy Office issued a writ banning Catholics from reading his works because they were dangerous. And many, including the post-conciliar popes, ignored that ban and read him and claimed the Holy Office misunderstood Chardin and tried to rehabilitate him. Perhaps the thing is amused by all of that, even now, a century after the fact. It happened, by the way, in 1919. What do you think about all this? Are you surprised by that account? Are you surprised that Francis is celebrating him? Are you surprised that the post-conciliar popes before him tried to rehabilitate him as well? I'm not that surprised. If you read what the, th the writings of the popes and their general way of approaching the supernatural aspects of the faith, you see a more shift towards materialist after World War II, especially after the council. All the popes of the post-conciliar years were guilty of this to some degree. So it's not that surprising that they would kind of grab onto Chardin. But Chardin's view of things is so out there that it doesn't, it's not compatible with Catholicism in the slightest. And his encounter with a thing really does sound like an admission of possession. And that he himself knew that was the case, but he felt compelled to write it anyway. So he did it in the third person. Let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. Hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So does sharing this on social media. That helps too. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.